welcome to the third in a series of webinars uh, put together by the Stop Far Right uh, Project in Maynooth University and funded uh, in association with Crosscare and funded by the Irish Research Council. Um, this uh, series of webinars is to explore different ideas around the far right and also how to counteract the far right in the context of Ireland, but learning from uh, other experiences as well. So I'm very uh, happy to introduce this third um, uh, installment, shall we say, the third webinar, where we've got three uh, academics from who are resident in uh, New Zealand to speak about the far right. Those three are Emmy, Emily Bosalai. Uh, Emily is a senior lecturer of political theory at the University of Wellington in New Zealand. And then Chamsi L. O'Hiley, uh, who's an associate professor at the University of Wellington in New Zealand as well. And finally, Sean Phelan, who is an associate professor of Massey University in New Zealand and is currently working as a Marie Curie fellow at the University of Antwerp, Belgium, but is also originally from County Tipperary in Ireland and has been settled in New Zealand since 2003. So all three are going to speak on the theme of the far right today and their different approaches to that subject. Uh, I'm Barry Cannon. I am the principal in investigator of the Stop Far Right project. And I am an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology in Maynooth University, uh, teaching politics there. So without further ado, what I'll do is I'll pass over to our three panelists. Uh, we're going to take them in alphabetical order. Each of the panelists are going to introduce themselves and talk about their works for about five minutes. And then after that, what we will do is we will go on to have a more general dis dis discussion between the four of us, uh, which will last for about 40 minutes or thereabouts, and then we'll open the, it to the floor for anybody who wants to ask questions of any of the panelists. So the whole thing should take about one and a half hours and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion that's going to take place. So uh, first of all, I'll ask you, Emily, if you're there. Hi, Emily. Hola. Hi, uh, good morning. Hi. It's Thank you. 8 a.m. in New Zealand, isn't that correct? Yeah, it's lovely to think it's, um, uh, evening where you are and we're still able to have this conversation. Absolutely. Great. Thank you for having us. Technology. So I wonder, Emily, if you would introduce yourself and introduce about your work, particularly uh, your work relevant to the issue of the far right. Tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Emily Beausole. Um, my, a little bit of my background is that I descend from French Huguenots who came over to Mohawk territory in Canada when, in the 1700s and we're part of the profound unsettling of Mohawk nation in that um, claiming of home and my mother in her own time my own lifetime came from England to the west coast of Canada where she met my father and had us had our family and so I grew up on unceded Coast Salish territory um, still unceded and, and still colonized to this day and about eight years ago I moved to Aotearoa New Zealand um, and started my own family here. And where I'm speaking to uh, you from today is Te Whanganui Atara, or is also known as Wellington, uh, where Te Atiawa, Taranaki Whanui, and um, Ngati Toa are mana whenua. So they are the um, author ultimate political authority in this place, whether it is acknowledged by the current government or not. Um, I, I am here only by virtue of Te Tiriti o Waitangi, which was signed in 1840, which uh, made commitments for all non-Maori uh, in order to be able to live with honour in this place, to stand up right in this place. So I am held uh, accountable to and under uh, the mantle of those commitments. Um, so I'm a democratic theorist. I study how advantaged groups can learn to listen better. I think that's really why I'm here is the work that I've been doing in that context. Um, a long time ago, I flipped the question of voice, marginalized voices to who's not listening and why and how can we listen better? Um, and what are those responsibilities? But especially what are the practical obstacles to that? How can we design to foster listening where it's needed and missing? most. Um, so in that context of that work, initially, I worked from a physiological context of what's happening in the body that causes what are our physiological 
responses are, that structure how we perceive and respond such that they create opening and closure to others. Um, but when I started to work specifically in the context of power with advantaged groups, um, it brought in very different dimensions to that story. So since I've lived here, it's really been a uh, study of how the social positions we inhabit and also the nature of structural claims like racism, white dominance, settler colonialism, how those create particular structures of feeling and unfeeling that pre-mediate what we see and don't see, how we respond, um, and how those um, explain a lot of the patterns of outright denial or uh, obliviousness or defensiveness or reactionisms that I think characterize a lot of what we see in the far right among other less extreme but certainly on the same spectrum among uh, places where whites are dominant and still can feel <laughs> marginalized by even the de slightest demand to listen. Um, in the last thing I'll say in terms of how um, the work has shifted, especially since studying the question in this place, partly because of the nature of the question shifting to a structural question, a structure of advantage groups listening to structural claims, uh, but also because of asking it here in Aotearoa and learning from uh, Maori and particularly the cultural protocols that are structures that enable meeting across profound difference from a Maori perspective um, that run across different kawa or traditions, uh, tr uh, the variations and protocols across different iwi or, or Maori nations across the country. Um, so my research is very practical. It's I call myself a pracademic. I'm really impatient with theory for theory's sake, I really want to know how we actually change, apply it in practical ways to address these pressing issues. I've worked with over 30 practitioners across sectors that are not studied in politics to, to learn what they know about how to foster listening when challenged. A number of um, the equivalent of say anti-racist educators, my uh, to TDT or Waitangi educators. So learning about the commitments of the treaty that allows us to be here, uh, and about the colonization that obscures those commitments and 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 um, uh, uh, fails to live up to them. Um, so we're learning from a number of to TDT educators, um, conflict mediators across genres, therapy. Um, various forms of interpersonal therapy and various uh, forms of performance artists. So um, whether it's clowns or comedians or um, theater makers, people that in all those sectors, even as we're being challenged to rethink how we see the world, our very identities are being challenged, we still stay open. So I spent many years learning from many different practitioners. What do they know that we could translate into contexts of racism, um, contexts of uh, white dominance, um, and in the context of that work, I have uh, also learned about tikanga marae, so the Maori protocols that enable uh, that structure meeting um, between groups. Um, and in the context of that work, there was a tiny provocation that was vast for me um, that has changed how I see this work and what we're listening for, what whites fail to hear actually, or what dominant groups, especially, but especially um, settler uh, colonists fail to hear and, and whites fail to hear. Um, we think we're just listening to the other, but we are almost always by the nature of that dominance failing to notice the structure and history that are a part of every particular moment. Um, and a failure to account for ourselves as a collective people is often getting in the way of being able to meet and resolve and transform many of these issues. Um, in um, Tikanga Marae, the very first step for the group that comes to the gate is to gather themselves as a people. Or what that means is not just physically gather to come through the gate, but know who they are as a group and why they've come. And that work never happens among settler groups, among dominant groups, to think of themselves as even having a social collective identity or inheritance. Um, it's almost offensive. You think you're just an individual. And I think that gets in the way, uh, that is one of the pieces missing and being able to um, meet uh, and be able to transform our relationships and being able to become responsible uh, for ourselves. Um, and, and so that's a big part of how this place has transformed how I do this work. So I'll leave it there for now. That's excellent, Emily. Thanks very much. It sounds really interesting and really uh, rich experience, um, which I'm sure we'll get, to, which we're going to get to explore a little bit more. Um, Chamsi, can I invite you now to introduce yourself in your work, please? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having me. Um, uh, I'm Chamsi Alajoli. I'm an associate professor in sociology at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, 
So my interest in the far right is, is really quite ideasy focused. You know, I'm focused on questions of ideology and utopia, and I'm not really a New Zealand specific sociologist. Um, my focus on the far right is, is more global, even though I think the far right here are really, really interesting in, in comparative perspective. Um, one of the main things that, uh, that shaped my research was my sense that a lot of the scholarly and popular commentary on the rise of the far right was missing something. There was something missing there. And what I wanted to do was draw on the ideas of Ernst Bloch and Antonio Gramsci to underscore first the utopian dimensions of far right thinking, that is the desires for a better way of being. But also secondly, to look at the way in which a range of appeals get pulled together into far right discourses uh, to create these compelling ideological syntheses. And by contrast, I think this sort of stuff gets really marginalized in, in most analyses of the far right. And there's a, a big focus on hate and fear, on the hate-filled and fear-filled qualities of the far right. And uh, sometimes even worse than this, there's something of a class hatred in play in some of these analyses where the assumption is that the far right constituency is to put it very crudely white trash or bad quality uh, human beings. And of course, if you spend any time on these far right sites looking at far right material, there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of hate, but I think an overemphasis on this um, can lead to what one commentator has called the politics of the fear of the fear. I think that's quite nice, the politics of the fear of the fear. So I guess what I was wanting to do was, was kind of look for a more empathetic, uh, inside out, maybe more strategic way of visualizing the far right, which paid attention to those more uh, hopeful aspects, those utopian aspects, which acknowledged that far right ideas work for a bunch of people, that there's a certain magic to them, and that they offer kind of plausible, powerful uh, cultural narratives. And what I did was I, I borrowed Enzo Traverso's term post-fascism as a way of bringing together different groups, different thinkers, different sites, parties on the right. And I suggested that we think of the far right as an atmosphere rather than a movement or an ideology, because it didn't seem as settled as a movement or an ideology. And then I tried to set out drawing on other literature on fascism and the far right, these five big component parts uh, of this post-fascist atmosphere. And for me, these were utopian appeals to identity and meaning, but also to a new type of politics of strength and decision-making, you know, the kind of take back control Brexit slogan. Secondly, anti-system and conspiracist mappings of the world and the power and this desire uh, to cleanse society, to, to obtain redemption from a present that was seen as full of decline and conflict and confusion. I thought third, you see the sort of politics of change that encompasses both appeals to charismatic authority, but also appeals to democracy. So it didn't seem to me that the far right was straightforwardly anti-democratic at all, uh, that there were a lot of appeals to participation, popular sovereignty, true representation. Uh, the fourth element I thought was a, a kind of a a backlash politics, an absolute obsession with left organizations and left values, kind of drawing from these, but also opposing from these, drawing energy from these. And fifth, a, a set of appeals to kind of military values of, you know, strength and violence and courage and power and virility and youth. And so my, my feeling was that we couldn't really understand and maybe combat the far right without a proper uh, understanding of those ideological and utopian dimensions. So that's me. Thank you. Um, right. Okay. That's great, Chamsi. Thanks a million. That's really interesting. Um, really uh, interesting perspective on it. Kind of chimes too with Emily's idea of listening and not just rejecting or uh, acting from fear immediately, but actually stopping back and listening to what people on the far right are saying and evaluating that. But we'll talk about that later.
Okay, Sean, would you like to introduce yourself now and discuss your work, please? Thanks, Barry. Uh, can I assume people can see my, my slides? Yeah. Yes, we can, yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, I thought it might be a good idea uh, to, to just put everything into two slides, so to stop myself from sort of rambling on too much. Uh, as Barry mentioned, I'm originally from Tipperary, so my uh, uh, formative experience of, of politics growing up was, you know, politics uh, was basically concerned with the question of whether you were a Fianna Fáil or a Fianna Gael house. So I guess the terrain I'm exploring here is, is rather different from that. Uh, and again, uh, thanks to Barry for asking me to be part of this. It's a little bit weird that, I, that I, uh, I'm doing this from Belgium and that I haven't been in New Zealand since 2019. So I'm not well placed to comment on what's going on in New Zealand at the moment. But a bit like Shamsi, my work is not specifically sort of focused on the New Zealand context. So I'll try to be quick. So basically, my, my current research isn't specifically about the far right as such. You know, I, I got a grant to do what I'm doing in Antwerp. And in the abstract for that, I don't think I make any reference to the far right or the far right of the title. Uh, but the two key projects that I'm working on at the moment, both, both touch the, a concern with the rise of the far right, the recent rise of the far right, and particularly it's sort of mediatized forms, because I'm a media and communication scholar, so I primarily look at these from, from a media and communications perspective, but I also have an interest in neoliberalism, political theory, and so on, and that all sort of textures how, how I think about these things. But the first project, and these are, I think of them as distinct projects, but they're also obviously overlapping projects. The first project is really around online culture and the politics of social justice. And the starting point for that was thinking about how talk about social justice and everything linked to the idea of, of, of justice, whether it's racial justice, climate justice, planetary justice, and so on, how that had become a key uh, sort of site and location for kind of antagonisms linked to the emergence of the far right. I like Shamsi's term atmosphere because that kind of resonates with how I think about these things as well. Uh, and for, for, in terms of how I'm approaching this in my research, that means looking at two distinct things. It means first looking at the emergence, uh, particularly through various forms of online, of various online publics, the, the emergence of different political constituencies who affirm the idea of social ju justice and frame their own politics in terms of a demand for social justice. So here we're talking about movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, Me Too, uh, trans activists. Uh, I think we can also think about this in the context of COVID, of the various online publics that insist that a commitment to social justice should be a priority of any sort of governmental response uh, to, to the pandemic. So, so I'm looking at, at that kind of a, a politics that speaks about social justice in an affirmative way. And of course, then I'm also looking, I also had to look at the sort of backlash polit politics. And here we're talking about the emergence of various forms of online far right culture linked with the emergence of the alt right and the sort of media fascination with the alt right from about 2016 onwards. And, we, and this is all obviously part of so-called cultural war politics. And my starting point for thinking about that was looking at the sort of disparagement of the figure of the social justice warrior. And the social justice warrior was this sort of figure that emerged out of uh, the Gamergate moment in 2014. And it became a sort of key figure of ridicule uh, for various far right publics. Uh, so they liked, you know, they, they got forms of enjoyment, uh, they, they forms of kind of collective you know, collective sort of, their own sort of uh, collective identity was enacted through a shared dispar disparagement and mocking of, of social justice warriors of woke culture and so on. Often that could take very vicious forms, but it also was often sort of coded within those cultures as humorous and so on. So what that means, I'm, I'm interested in looking at how kind of anti-wokeness, if you want to use that term, how that has become a key site of sort of antagonisms of today's politics and particularly sort of, I don't like using the term that much, but you inev I inevitably find myself using it kind of culture war politics. Uh, and what's interesting about that, that has the capacity to bring different identities together who would see themselves as quite different from each other, but they can all come together on a shared sort of disparagement of certain sort of figures that are seen as exemplary of the kind of left-wing progressive politics that they, that they hold in sort of contempt. 
so, so you can see this in terms of, as I say, various subcultures, but a lot of this is easily in mainstream. And that's why, and one of the reasons why it's easily mainstream, well, you're as perhaps likely to find disparaging references to social justice warriors in your Sunday independent supplement at the weekend, as you were on, on these sort of extreme, so, you know, platforms like 4chan and so on. And I think then to complicate the picture further, you also see parts of the left that, 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 uh, that critique things like social justice warriors, uh, things like wokeness, uh, cancel culture, and so on. And again, uh, you know, there's aspects of that that could be deeply problematic. You can see strands of the online left that seem to get as much enjoyment from that disparagement as part of the far right. But at the same time, there is something, in, when people talk about categories like woke capitalism, there is something, I think, important to that. You can even see this in universities, you know, where, where the university will be, will be publishing its... Uh, uh, you know, a campaign around mental health awareness at the, sa at the same time re negotiating these really shitty contracts for, for adjunctive employees and so on. So that's the first project. The second project, and, I, and I'll try to be quick. The second project, which is sort of my official Marie Curie project, that's more focused on the question of, of critique. And my starting point here was looking at how the significance of platforms like Twitter for sort of everyday critiques and criticisms of media and journalism. Now, this obviously links to the far right because we can think about how important antagonism to the media, how that was so crucial to the political identity articulated by, by far right exemplars like Trump, Bolsonaro, and so on. This project has different sort of empirical elements, like one of the things I'm doing at the moment, I've interviewed journalists in both Belgium and Ireland where I'm talking to them about their experiences of this culture of online critique. But sort of conceptually, the thing that probably interests me most at the moment is kind of thinking about the place of critique and critical theory more generally in the current conjuncture. And again, that looks at two sort of distinct elements that are parts of, of a kind of antagonistic politics. And first, and one, one starting point or one reference for how I think about these things is sort of work that's sometimes framed under the banner of post critique or critique of critique. Uh, that questions how sometimes critique is done within academic scholarship. Now, I, a lot of my work has been, has been written in the idiom of critique. I've done a lot of my work around neoliberalism and I, I'm a, a commitment to critiquing neoliberalism and some idea of trying to articulate some sort of our, our, our emancipatory politics. But here I draw on the work of people like Rita Felsky, who she defines, she, she describes critique or she defines it as defined by a certain hermeneutics of suspicion. So a tendency, often for good reason, to look at how the world is organized in suspicious terms. But as Bruno Latour discussed in a well-known article from 2004, why his critique went out of steam, it's clear that there has been a bit of a cultural pattern where some of the idioms and the tropes and what he called the weapons of critique have been sort of appropriated by the far right. And so this is uh, the, the other key part of what's going on, I think, in the current conjuncture, this emergence of a very hyper-reactionary forms of suspicion that are driven by heterogeneous identities, some obviously on the extreme right, far right, but some that present themselves as liberal and so on. And so you can think about things like, you know, the importance of, of there's a meme about the Frankfurt School, you know, there's a meme that suggests Adorno, Horkheimer, and Marcuse are like key figures that sort of explain all the kind of malaise, mal malaise of, the, so, of, of today's sort of society. Uh, and also there's been other books by people like Mark Levin, the book Cynical Theories. And the most obvious expression of this at the moment is the wild uh, sort of antagonism towards critical race theory that you see in the US. So that's a very brief description of the kind of key things that I'm, that I'm working on at the moment. Sorry, did I go on? I went on too long, I apologize. Sorry, that's, a, that's okay, uh, don't worry about it. We've got plenty of time. Um, that's great, Sean. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll talk about these later. Okay, uh, now we're going to go to a little bit more of a structured part uh, where we're going to, I'm going to ask you to speak a little bit more about your work in more detail by asking particular questions of each of you. Um, and I'll start with you, Emily, if I can figure out how to work this. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and 
I, I think it's just really interesting, Emily, when you're talking about this notion of listening and particularly, I mean, I think it's really a, an amazing thing to do and a really good idea. Listening is so important and it's something that we forget about a lot in politics. But uh, this idea of actually listening to the advantaged um, and uh, seems to me to be sort of, I don't know, counterintuitive or something like that, when you consider that many people, the advantage often don't listen to the disadvantaged or the marginalized. Um, and so I wonder like, if you could sort of unpack that a little bit about what your reasoning is there. Um, and also another thing I'd like you to talk about is the notion of oblique listening, which is a concept that I came across in some of your writings. So maybe you could bring that into it as well. I hope that- Yeah, that's actually, thank you. That um, Your concern is actually why there's a focus on not just listening, but oblique listening, a particular curation of engagement that is um, really that whole project about what kind of um, listening is prompted by the research, both my own and others that show that listening is itself very potent as part of a strategy for enabling transformation where we're most entrenched, when there are these incredible reactionisms and all investment in not move, moving an inch. Um, that listening itself is a martial art. And that's something that came up through the research of working with all these practitioners who help foster opening in, in the face of difficulty. So my focus is on how to get advantage groups, particularly those who refuse to listen and, and benefit from not listening, to listen. And I was really surprised to find that listening itself was continually the way that was possible in these sites that are renowned for enabling us to open when we're challenged. Um, it seems so counterintuitive and I love a counterintuitive quandary. Um, so staying with it, just sort of um, how does that work? Um, and it is linked, just to clarify too, what I was mentioning before was not others listening to advantage groups in terms of when I was talking about listening to ourselves. Um, what I was trying to point out there was some of the biggest obstacles to being able to um, act honorably, react well when called to attend to issues from which we benefit. Some of the main obstacles stem from an utter obliviousness to the very world in which we live, um, and particularly the structural and historical conditions of our own lives. Um, and that came through both in the provocation from uh, those I was training with, with Tikanga Maori, uh, in terms of like, you don't, you don't, we can't even begin to meet until you know who you are as a people, like what's behind you and why you're here and, um, and looking at settler peoples or dominant groups and particularly those reacting from this place of, oh, I'm being put in a corner because I'm my usual supremacy is being challenged is an utter entrenched inheritance, a collective inheritance of an inability to think of ourselves as a people and to, and to see that we have a collective identity and inheritance and a responsibility. Um, I'm gonna share a slide with you here. So I'm gonna backtrack to that, that research. Um, hold on, I'll come to it. Uh, it's not letting me do, uh, I'll just share my initial screen. Yeah, so it's happening, yes. Yeah. Um, it's kind of embedded in the rest of it, but. I'll yeah. find a way to make it a slideshow. So um, there we go. That's better, yeah. Um, um, from current slide. So um, as I said, um, I, I took this provocation to turn back to my own people, my own, um, to, to, to um, those still at the gate, um, settlers and white uh, communities to say, what is it that is part of, what is the practice of marking out who we are as a people that we seem to fail to do? So in, um, I don't, you know, again and again in the media, you hear people deeply offended, whites, deep, especially white men, deeply offended by being described as a social group at all. And I think that's part of this resistance to wokeness, certainly resistance to critical race theory right now that we see is it's deeply, so deeply foreign, but also even offensive to be to have anyone say that your perspective or your position is in any way shaped by the, the, your collective identity that collective history. And so I look, was trying to take up this challenge that was presented of gathering at the gate, gathering our people and thought, what is it about our people that gets makes this so difficult? 
one of the things that came up is this philosophical tradition, as far back as Plato, certainly, where you come to truth, to freedom, to, to fulfillment, every good thing through an abstraction from the particular context in which you live and aspiring to universals. So there's a deep desire and an ontology that comes from a Western way of thinking that is presuming to speak about the whole world from nowhere. Being nowhere is itself the aspiration. The even presumption it could be possible is part of our ontology. And that's really interesting to me. I think that traces all the way through. So there's a deep belief that and an aspiration for being able to be uh, claim the whole world from nowhere. The second, certainly in settler colonial contexts or when we're looking at dominant groups, but is this history of being able to write that ontology and worldview into uh, the places in which we're dominant, such that it feels like the very fabric of the world. It, the, it takes a dream and it makes it a reality through writing it into the institutions, the laws, the curriculum, the whole world in which those groups are dominant comes to dream that dream that we can claim to be, to see the whole world from nowhere, that we are unmarked. We don't even see our own cultural difference. Um, we don't think we even have a culture a lot of the time because it is the national culture or it's presumed to be the norm, uh, the world rather than a particular ground. And the third thing that of course comes in the settler colonial context, and this is true in the States, I think this is true with the reactionisms and xenophobia we see in the UK towards migrant groups, is a, a collective amnesia about the history of that dominance, the history of that colonial taking that colonial invasion that goes on to the day, but is again written in, into that society such that we presume that what we're in now is just um, everything in its rightful place. So it's highly naturalized. We do not teach our histories in schools. We do not hear it in the media, the frames the media are using, uh, the frames our government are using are show this um, insistence on uh, what um, James Baldwin calls a fretful dreaming or fretful, uh, the, sorry, that's um, Stephen Turner in the context of Aotearoa New Zealand and settler amnesia. James Baldwin describes this uh, insistent, this forgetting, collective forgetting as um, being like a butterfly impaled on a pin, um, deeply um, um, struggling uh, with the history that they know they've told themselves is actually it, it, that it's actually a lie, but unable to resolve that um, incongruence and suffering for it. So being unable to claim our own history, to know our own history, to grapple with that and thus move through with um, bring that to the gate actually uh, keeps us locked in this position. So I see this as part of this inheritance. I think this is interesting that our ground, the particular ground from which we meet, and I think dominant groups, especially white groups, they, they meet the particular way that we see is shaped by this inheritance of being an unmarked people through this particular history that obscures its own history and difference. So that was part of the work that I was trying to say, well, what is it to learn to name the ground, mark a ground of unmarkedness? How does that unmarkedness claiming to not have a place and just be able to take over the whole world, see the whole world from nowhere, never being responsible for that particular partial, partial and um, perspectival ground. How does that shape how we see and how we react? Um, I also think this is a really powerful metaphor that comes up in terms of how social advantage also creates um, an inability to see. Um, uh, talking about the breeze at my back, we talk about struggle, but when we talk about advantage, often it's not even discussed, but when um, it is looked at, it's experienced as largely unsensed. So the advantages we have are not visible to us, they're not sensed by us, uh, we don't feel how others struggle, uh, and we fail to struggle in the world that is unjustly um, structured. Um, I think of this like a tailwind and a headwind, if you're biking in a headwind, you feel it keenly. The constraints and struggles of our uh, external to us are so keenly felt. But when we have a breeze at our back, it's easy to fall into a meritocratic self-rationalization of, well, you know, I worked hard for this. You know, I'm just really good at biking. I think social advantage works much the same way. And so this failure to sense the conditions that are shaping our lives mean that um, for all these reasons, for the historical context and for the way that social advantage works, it means that inhabiting a position of advantage, and this is very true for whites, it is true for settlers, it means it comes with the numbness. Charles Mills calls this the ironic outcome of being unable to see the world they themselves have made. 
think that's wonderful. The ironic outcome uh, that they cannot see the world they themselves have made. We are oblivious to the conditions in which we live, historical and structural. Uh, and we see this in common discourses of individualism, universalism. Um, but also it produces cognitive vices. So Jose Medina describes this as epistemic vices that come with advantage. Um, when you are in an advantaged position, when you're used to the world being made for you, um, you are often trusted more readily, you are given more time, you are presumed to be a knower. Um, and all of that over time spoils us. And this is, um, you know, shows in studies that men, in meetings, when women speak for 30% of the time, they're subjectively perceived as being par speaking in parody. And when they, or sorry, at 15%, if women speak for 15% of the time, men in those meetings perceive them to be equally speaking. And when they speak for 30% of the time, men perceive them to be, be dominating. So the subjective, um, uh, the way that our social position is structuring what we see and how we see it, what we do and don't see, also means we're misreading our environments continually. But these cognitive um, uh, vices also mean we're bad at learning. So we become blind to our blind spots. We're lazy when it comes to um, encountering other views. We are arrogant and presuming we know more than we do. And that actually creates meta blindness. So blindness to our blindness uh, and difficulties learning. And finally, um, it, this social inhabiting these positions of power, you know, um, you can see this with incel thinking about um, male dominance, you can see this with um, uh, um, a white dominance, but we're very thin skinned from a lack of experiences of being challenged on social positions. So one activist said recently to me, when you even talk about race, it can sound to some people like shouting. So the numbness itself means we're oversensitive because we think everything is in its rightful place so when you are challenged you feel marginalized even though it's just a rectification of an imbalance um, but also we lack the resources to stand to hear the challenge so we have the worst kind of reactions when we are called to listen even a little so i think this knowing this um inheritance and the way that these um, social structural historical conditions shape how we see and shape how we react. I think it uh, helps us um, uh, uh, take responsibility for some of these patterns of hyper reactionisms. Here's some examples from Aotearoa, New Zealand, but also elsewhere. Um, you know, in the wake of the March 15th attacks, even having uh, the call to prayer um, uh, televised or um, the Quran read in Parliament, which is the first time it's ever happened, was seen to be too much, you know, absolutely too much unable to see how um, a white world, uh, a Western liberal world dominates in every other respect. Similarly, um, being able to say that straight white male has become the century's N-word, you know, this perception of victimization is born of that obliviousness coupled with that hypersensitivity. Um, and it, it leads to these reactionisms that are very common. I also think it leads um, to some really interesting strategizing. So I'll talk about that, I think, in relation to your next question about how we, and that speaks to your question about how does listening to advantage groups potentially act as a potent strategy. And I'll, I'll leave that for the next, for later, but that helps set us up a little about the conditions I'm, I'm seeking to address with that later strategizing work. That's great. Thanks, Amelia and Emily. That's really interesting. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Chamsi, uh, I'll, I'll move on to you now. And um, one of the things that I find interesting about your work is how you reject the whole concept of extremism. So you argue that basically it's, 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 it's not good to label particular groups or organization extremists. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about the position, especially in relation to the far right? Yeah, I mean, as you say it now, maybe I was bending the stick too far in one direction there, but uh, I maybe guess I'm what in that paper you're, you're, you're referring to, my co-author Dylan Taylor and I were just, we were responding to this very steep increase in extremism talk and popular academic government circles. So there's been a a massive leap in volume in this talk from the decade of the 1990s to the first decade of the 21st century, and then another massive leap from the first to the second decade of the 21st century. And we were a bit skeptical 
about this extremism talk for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, even experts in the field like Cass Mudd say the concept is very murky. Extremism often just gets its substance from other equally murky concepts like fanaticism or radicalism or fundamentalism. Often extremism gets defined as that which sits outside of the mainstream. So there's this is a bit of an easy target, but a 2015 Australian government report on violent extremism, which talked about extremism as attitudes and behaviours that significantly differed from how most members of society view social issues and engage politically. Um, now, historically, of course, this definition applies to votes for women and anti-slavery politics. So I think it, it can start to make you a bit, a bit skeptical. And indeed, in that report, committed environmentalism gets pitched as leaning towards the in the direction of, of extremism. In the period of Trump, there were numerous attempts to think about anti-fascism as a form of extremism or domestic terrorism. And I think it's bizarre that we're talking about anti-fascism in a negative, uh, a negative way at this point. Um, so there's this idea in the literature that there's this generic extremism out there. And into this category, you can throw fascists, but also anti-fascists. You can throw uh, people who support uh, ISIL, but you can also throw deep green environmentalists into that category. Uh, another definition in that government publication was that extremists are those who seek to substantially transform the nature of society. And I think this is really problematic as well, because often in this extremism talk, people who are trying to uh, substantially transform society are pathologized, right? So if you're talking about Islamists, you know, often the explanations are cultural backwardness. If you're talking about other supposed extremists, you're talking maybe about personality disorders or crippled epistemology or involvement in negative countercultures. Um, and I think at, at its worst, this literature can feel incredibly smug about the achievements of actually existing liberalism. It can feel like a, a, a series of conformist prohibitions on critical thinking. It can feel very exclusionary rather than kind of dialoguing with people. And of course, I'm, I'm not suggesting in the slightest that there aren't people out there with, uh, with views that incline them towards you know, violent behavior or oppression or exploitation or dehumanization. But I just think we should tighten up what we're talking about. And I don't think uh, that concept of extremism is helpful uh, very often. Maybe I could uh, answer some of the other stuff about the far right in my answer to the next question. Mm. Uh, thanks, Chelsea. I mean, it makes me think also about the use of the term populism to, and the way that popul populism can be used as this, as this blanket term to dump all sorts of different things that basically we don't like into yeah. that bag and then sideline it and not actually discuss the, 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 the substance of it, basically, you know? And also yeah. making equivalences between diametrically opposed projects. Uh, that's also the thing I don't like, that idea that far right, far left, they kind of end up converging. They're just as bad as each other. And, uh, you know, it's just sort of like the totalitarianism concept, right? You know, that, that, that fascism and communism, it's essentially the same thing. And I think that that's just not very helpful at all. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'm just having a bit of a... Yeah, um, Sean, I'll, I'll move on to you now and to talk a little bit more about your projects. Um, sorry, yeah. Um, and then just like talking about your first project there, which was about social justice warriors and the role of social justice, justice warriors. And uh, I just was reading your paper there and you make a link between uh, neoliberalism and the disparagement of, or the disparagement inherent in the term social justice warriors. Um, so I was wondering if you could also talk a little bit there about the relationship between neoliberalism and the far right, uh, 
are, you know, are the far right challenging or strengthening neoliberalism? Uh, how do each the far right and I suppose the mainstream right or mainstream ne neoliberalism actually reinforce each other, but at the same time are in some way uh, against each other? Perhaps maybe you could talk a little bit about those links within the context of your work about social justice warriors. Sure, Barry. Uh, I mean, I'll just give a context to that paper that you read. Uh, I started thinking about that paper in about 2015, 2016, and probably like different research projects that people are doing around, around far-right culture, politics. Uh, it was, it, I do this exercise in class where I give students a term and I ask them to kind of think of how, how they might construct a discourse around it. And one day in class, I gave the, the small tutorial, the term social justice. And the first response I got, the first two responses where they made reference to the figure of the social justice warrior, which I don't think I had heard prior to that, or if I, if I had heard that I hadn't sort of properly taken it in. And I was, so, I was so struck by it because it wasn't a student who was particularly vocal in class, didn't seem like a student who was particularly trenchant in their political, in their politics. Uh, but I could see how it resonated with them. And I can remember even a, a kind of visual impression of a kind of uh, a slight sneer on the person's face as if to communicate social justice warriors, those people who think they're great and perform their sort of virtue online. Uh, and so, you know, we, we have a whole alt-right lexicon that, that started talking about this stuff that started circulating was mainstream in 2015, 2016. But what I immediately, the connection that immediately came to mind for me was the work, uh, was neoliberalism in, gen, in general, but particularly the work of Friedrich Hayek, who is generally rec recognized as the most sort of important theorist of neoliberalism. And of course, he was really antagonistic to the idea of social justice. He once... Uh, wrote a book titled the mirage, of, the mirage of Social Justice, and he described it as this completely incoherent concept, and he basically wanted it to completely be eliminated from sort of political vocabulary. So I, I found that interesting that at a time when neoliberalism was increasingly in crisis, and people were talking about, you know, for not for the first time, we're talking about the end, the death of neoliberalism, I found it interesting you could see how aspects of neoliberalism, political rationality, were re-emerging in forms that seem to be resonating with some of the students in my class. And I guess that goes back to how I think of neoliberalism more generally. I, I wrote a book on neoliberalism, uh, you know, particularly looking at it from uh, sort of media context and quite a few chapters actually focused primarily on Ireland. Uh, but I, I always think of neoliberalism rather than thinking it as this uh, monolithic uh, identity. I think it is as something that can be articulated in sort of different ways. Now, Nancy Fraser has captured this. She's, she has this sort of typology between sort of the reactionary neoliberalism of the 80s, progressive neoliberalism of the third way, and the sort of hyper-reactionary neoliberalism of the present. Other people have talked about this idea of sort of mutant neoliberalism. And I guess that just resonated for me, that you could see how there was a kind of resonances between sort of, you know, these, these far-right these forms of popular culture that had emerged in these sort of online platforms like 4chan and 8chan that uh, were progressive, you know, kind of progressively mainstream from 2016 onwards, you know, to the extent now that, that terms like cancel culture, uh, uh, wokeness and so on se seem to be just a, a ubiquitous part of political vocabulary. It's even striking here in Belgium and Netherlands. Even when I arrived here in 2019, and I, I remember having a conversation with somebody where I told them I was working on this stuff, and they said, oh yeah, it doesn't sound like it's, they, they didn't seem to relate it to the local context, but I met them recently, they said, you know what, all that stuff you're going on about, they're now hearing far-right politicians in Flanders that are complaining about wokeness, you know, the kind of white reactionary politics that, that Emily talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I mean, I think also, you know, I think that issue of mainstreaming has really come up in previous seminars here as well uh, that we've we have held, you know, um, about how increasingly far right language and far right ideas are being mainstreamed by by um, established politicians, you could say. Uh, 
but of course, there's a question there as well about, you know, where that comes from originally and if it ever was sort of sidelined at all in the first place, you know, um, sort of a chicken and egg kind of thing. Okay, um, thanks, Sean. Uh, Emily, I'll, I'll just go back to you again. Um, and so like when we, the last time that you spoke, you were talking about this resistance of privileged groups to listen to the claims of the marginalized, shall we say, um, and, and, and how to, and then to look at strategies. And that comes from a failure to be able to see yourself as being privileged in many ways. Um, and then I'd like you to talk now a little bit about the sort of practical strategies that you were talking about earlier, about how to try to foster that kind of, to open people to be prepared to listen uh, of those privileged groups and to begin to set aside uh, or to begin to recognize their, themselves as a people, you know, exactly. for example, yeah. yeah. So I wonder, and there was two um, particular uh, um, initiatives that I would like you to talk about. The one is the Tawi Tau Toko initiative. Um, and another one is, and this is one of my favorites because it's something that um, I read in your paper about oblique listening and I really liked that even, which is Barbarian Productions Sing It To My Face Choral Project. So I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about those two projects and how they managed to counteract um, uh, these uh, sort of reactionary pol politics uh, was fostering listening as well. Thank you. Um, one, the thing that connects all, all of the practices, the sites of practice that I studied across these four sectors um, and within the diverse range within each of those sectors um, was this gem of um, a counterintuitive insight. So when we typically are not having the responsiveness and listening acknowledgement by advantage groups that we so desperately are seeking when we're looking at these, um, especially these dominant groups that are claiming victim status in various ways and then mobilizing, you know, resentment, mobilizing a revenge of various forms or um, even as Chomsky says, Chomsky says the utopian vision of, of uh, a prior ascendancy. Um, uh, one of the, what we usually turn to are what's called disruptive politics. So we, as most conventional activism, for example, um, works through um, getting louder, using more platforms, using force and pressure, mobilizing expertise. Um, and we see in those strategies, certainly really important, important mechanisms to mobilize critical mass and break norms to say this is unacceptable. This is a make, but, but what disruptive politics do is they make it difficult to do the, the thing that is deemed unjust. They don't, they sidestep transforming views. So often when you have those strategies, crucial as they are, crucial as they are, they um, do not actually do that work of actually trying to work with changing the view and it can actually go underground. It can find you know, other enclaves and come up later in various other toxic forms as we see. So I was really interested in, in what I found in these sites um, th in therapy, conflict mediation and so on. And this is across the performance arts as well. They do not make change possible by pushing from A to B, by saying this is the clear and insistent uh, message about where we should be, you know, to say this should, you know, that that pressure, force, and clarity that defines so much of our usual politics and our usual activism. Instead, what they do is, I say, uh, I call a sort of poetics, as opposed to a pragmatics. We think that's very pragmatic to be as forceful and strong as possible, as clear as possible. In most of these uh, sites, they're using a poetic approach, which is instead of forcing change in the immediate, they mobilize their own ability to listen for what is already present such that those there start to hear it themselves and that is what catalyzes powerful change you know and physiologically this is really interesting as well so when we are given facts that counter our view we know that this actually causes us to double down on our view um, until we hear something that affirms our view on the physiological level of the flow of cortisol and adrenaline and the effects on the higher uh, cortices um, it fact checking doesn't work argument doesn't work again the direct approach doesn't work 
Mm. So whether it's disruptive politics or whether it's the direct argument, it actually has a counterproductive response when it comes to softening and changing the views that we want to change. Um, and so I thought this was really powerful, this um, listening itself and enabling, as um, psychodramatist Bev Hosking said in our interview, I listen so they can listen to themselves. Um, the transformative mediator Deb Hip Hipperson also similarly said, even though the name transformation is in the title of their field, they do not, they make that change possible, not by seeking immediate change, but by letting someone feel heard such making a connection and enabling, therefore, all these things soften and jostle and change when that connection or when that being with what is here in a non judgmental way, it's so counterintuitive, it goes against all my wiring. Mm. That is what catalyzes all this change. So I, I thought, well, how can we translate this into a more practical sites? This is this is very cool. And it's not it's underused as a way of thinking about how we make change, especially when it's most difficult and needed. Um, and so I'm just going to share this with you. Um, my, um, I worked with Action Station, which is the grassroots national campaigning organization here in Aotearoa. They have sister organizations in Canada and the UK and Australia and around the world. There's about nine or 10 of them. And they wanted to do something different as well. And um, what we ended up creating, the project was in light of the uh, specifically anti-Maori racism online and the amount of toxicity in these online spaces. How could we translate what I've been learning about that are highly iterative in-person kind of arts, very open-ended and difficult and long-term, take time to unfold in terms of these sites of practice. How can we translate that into the really rapid fire space, toxic space of online racism? And so we created this project. We've trained over 140 people around the country over this 10 week program that we've created um, to address racism online. Um, and it brings together these listening arts with what um, they've already been using, which are values-based messaging, uh, two forms of communication that we know help create, move people to more progressive or open views, um, um, but had never been brought together. So in terms of the, the effects we see, what's exciting about this, we had a researcher study the uh, roughly 10,000 interventions that our volunteers made online over a 10 week period. And these, this volunteer, this researcher tracked what the impacts were. And one um, affirmed also by another one of our volunteers who was interviewing a number of online professional moderators. So she was undergoing our program while she was interviewing them. And these professional moderators whose task is to create more civil discourse, they said they do not see the effects that we see. And I just think that's very exciting. Um, but the kinds of impacts we were able to document in a more systemic way and um, by this researcher's study, um, uh, were uh, the following, and she also was able to track which aspects of our approach were used in each instance. So we were able to see very concretely uh, which combination of aspects of our approach and um, uh, made the most difference. Uh, in, and specifically, she found that the more that volunteers accurately aligned their approach with our model, the more we saw these impacts. So thinking of the online space specifically, uh, as opposed to our own conversations with people that we know, it, uh, the anonymity, the speed of it, the culture of dismissiveness and um, uh, it, it, you know, unaccountability means it's incredibly difficult. You also have very little time with someone. Uh, and so the fact that we see these impacts is very exciting. Um, often they are shifts in tone, and these are certainly the impacts that we see, especially when we're using the listening based aspects of our approach. So from highly dismissive, skeptical, very suspicious, um, we see people move from being calmer, being open, um, being able to acknowledge um, that they don't see the whole world from nowhere, which I, for one, am very excited when I see that. I think that's a big part of these racist views, these dominant views that, um, uh, that are so misplaced, uh, views of dominant groups that are so misplaced, um, but also going from anger and that aggression to being able to be more qualified, more tempered, that itself creates all this opening. And again, that's where listening is a martial art. If we can use listening to enable listening, then things can get through. I just think that's very exciting. 
Um, we also, of course, see our this, uh, this, this different quality of engagement ruin some pretty awful conversations. We see that as a win as well. Like we, we ruin the party. We ruin a lot of really ugly parties when there's toxic rapid fire exchange, reinforcing, amplifying a racist worldview. Um, we're able to, we, we count that as a win. Uh, we especially, when we, uh, we were also watching specifically for when people who are targets of racism were uh, saying thank you or affirming that view. We got that quite a bit, especially, interestingly, when we use the part of the approach where we are taking responsibility for our particular position. And that connects back to that notion of uh, I saw as the call of gathering at the gate that we just never do. It was interesting to me that especially people who are targets of racism were very, most appreciative of when we were saying, well, these are the experiences that lead me to see this this way. Uh, I speak from this position and, you know, like you, I maybe learned this in school, but this experience made me see differently. We deliberately don't come in as an expert in this model. So when we do bring our own view, we break that habit that is actually reinforces the adversarial uh, and counterproductive dynamic uh, of fact checking. Instead, we very specifically situate ourselves from uh, born of our own experiences, shaped by our own experiences. So what we're also trying to bring into view from others through the questioning, listening technique, we're listening so they listen to themselves and draw what is invisible and centered into view so it can be subject to critique. We also were trying to model that in this approach. So that's the two pronged approach. Um, and then also considering how rare it is to have, how little time you have, how toxic it is, how unaccountable we are. The fact that we do see shifts in actual position within a few interventions is amazing to me. So we do have people change their actual claim. We see the activation of values like compassion or parity and so on that serve the kinds of projects that we strive for. Um, we have acknowledgement of complexity um, that, that these people don't see the whole world, which is powerful in terms of um, this work. So those are the kinds of changes we see online with this when we have mobilized this in one of the most uncontrolled and toxic environments. Um, and our research has said, you know, it's clear that listening and values-based approaches are effective. Overall, where strategies are employed well, you can see changes in other people's thinking, which is extremely encouraging and so on. And so we've been changing, especially in Aotearoa, New Zealand. What we do is we intervene on spaces where news stories are being shared publicly. So there's a meeting of people across real difference, which doesn't happen so often these days, but there's a chance for a dialogical component, which you don't get on Twitter and so on. And so it's this, and it's also statistically one of the most toxic spaces uh, compared to other social media. So we really focused on uh, these sites and where especially Facebook is sharing news stories and people are meeting in those, uh, you know, triggered by the, the clickbait of the, of the story or the content of that story to, to express racist views. Um, what we're listening for, though, is very important. Sorry, sorry Emily, but uh, we're yeah. going to have to move on a little bit because we're kind of running out a bit of time. Oh, I'm sorry, but yeah, I'm happy to All keep right. talking about this in the Q&A about what we're listening for. So we're not validating the view. That's important to say. And I'm happy to talk about that later. How, what we're listening for is very specific. OK. That's great. Thanks a million. Yeah. Um, sorry about that now. Um, uh, by the way, everybody, uh, if you've got any questions, you're welcome to send them through the Q&A now um, and we'll get to them uh, 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 as the time progresses no? um, uh, Chamsi, I just want to move on to to talk to you again a little bit about the concept of you use the concept of utopia you refer to that in your introductory um, presentation as well uh, and again like a little bit like Emily's work too this seems kind of counterintuitive in the sense like I associate utopia with something positive. So how can you talk about utopia in the context of something like the far right, where we think that many of the ideas are pretty toxic and pretty negative. Uh, and also in, in a way, because we're also kind of living in an anti-utopian or indeed dystopian times. So I'd like you just to talk a wee bit more about, about, about utopia and why we should look for utopian ideas within far right ideas. Um, yeah, and I think I, I feel like there are real, real elective affinities between uh, what Emily's doing and what I'm interested in. Um, and I think you're right, you know, there's just a heck of a lot on catastrophe and loss and decline right now. Uh, and I'm really influenced by the work of Ernst Bloch, who's, you know, really insistent that 
hope always vanquishes fear and and that kind of thing. I think it's really important to focus on those more hopeful parts of discourse. And I think the kind of element of hope or utopia, which um, Professor Ruth Levitas defines simply as desires for a better way of being. So that doesn't guarantee that they're nice and friendly and inclusive. They're just about mm. future oriented hopes. But that utopian dimension often gets ignored uh, people focus a lot on ideology and discourse, which is about, you know, re particular representations of, of, of the social world and of power, but that future-oriented aspect often gets, um, gets missed. And I think that's one of the really nice things about Bloch is that he, he finds this desire uh, for a better way of being absolutely everywhere. It's there in everyday daydreaming and popular culture even the worst popular culture and in social movement, religion, myth. And he, he says, and I think it's very true, we all partially live in the future. And this future orientation, it's not just escape or impotent dreaming. It actually does stuff. It's material. And, and I felt, because I, I, you know, I find looking at that far-right stuff very, very upsetting. So it's partly a you know, seeing this this discourse expand, it's partly a self-preservation strategy to be a little bit more hope oriented, to see it in a in a bit of a, a a more compassionate way. And and you know, really, I'm I'm not doing anything at all new because Bloch himself did this. He he wrote a book on the utopian dimension of fascism in through the 1920s and the early 1930s, which was eventually published is a heritage of our times. Um, and, you know, Bloch was a Marxist and the typical response of Marxists to fascism at that point is to see fascism simply as a rational, false, nihilistic, incoherent. It was simply the expression of capitalism and decay. Uh, and they tended to see fascism as inevitably doomed, right? It was doomed because one, it was out of step with the lived reality of the mass of people and two, because Marxist science would demolish false uh, fascist ideas, you know, it would, it, Marxism would debunk these claims. And this was obviously incredibly wrong-headed. They got this incredibly wrong. And Bloch knew this already in the 1920s. Um, he rejected the idea that, and this is, connects with what Emily is saying, that truth simply makes its own way in the world. You know, you you disprove false ideas and they disappear. And he rejects just sheer denunciation, you know. Fascists are simply a tool of the capitalist class or doomed petty bourgeoisie or lump and proletariat or whatever. And so he's really aware that there's a there's a there's a, a magic to fascism, that it works for people. And most of his book is trying to unpack this magic to think about it. And he's saying what we find in fascism is uh, authentic desires for something else, because utopia is always a critical mirror on the present. You know, when we think about a better way of being, we're also turning back to criticize how things are. So it is a genuine critique of our institutions, our practices, our ways of being. And as I've said, you know, for Bloch, fascism does its magic through synthesizing, bringing together a whole lot of Thing. So it's drawing from the past, from folklore and myth and Christianity and paganism. It's stealing elements from the left and, and the far right today does that in, in uh, quite a bit. It's appealing to life and will and creation. So it's exciting and it's visceral. It's speaking about roots and meaning and home. And we're all interested in these kinds of things. It's adding these futuristic dimensions, talking about the potential of industrial dynamism or new technology. So it's a real hybrid and it's not just drawing, you know, a particular class or type of people. It's able to draw in a whole lot of different people through these appeals. So this was my model and, and I, I found it really helpful to try and dig around and, and find some of those more, those more hopeful aspects. Uh, and I think, I think that's really important um, to bear in mind so that you uh, you know, you don't just shout at people, I suppose. I suppose it's quite similar to what Emily's wanting to do, mm -hmm. kind of really try and understand what, what, what's working about this, this, uh, this idea for you. Thanks. That's great. Thanks a million. Yeah. 
Um, sorry, Sean, I hope you don't mind, but we've got a couple of questions here and we're sort of running uh, out of time as well. Um, we just got sure, minutes late. So uh, I'd like to, you know, go through the questions. And both of the questions are for Emily. Um, I'd like to say that, I don't know if you can see these questions, can you? Um, I don't know. Anyway, I'll read out, the, the, the one I'd like to read out here is from a woman called, or a person called Shanette Budai. And Shanette has got a question for you. And uh, Shanette says, I'm a person of color. I'm seeing more and more, more and more members of my family, friends who are first generation immigrants, buttress the dominant views of privileged people around them. This support runs directly against the best interest of my family, friends. Example, family voting for politician who is racist and has strong anti-immigration views. I'm struggling to make sense of their support. Uh, so that's, it's not really a question, it's more of a statement. Um, and, uh, and I've got a second uh, question here as well from Ibiscay Gonzalez. Uh, Ibiscay says, um, and again, this is for you, Emily, uh, it's difficult for disadvantaged people to be listened because we, we they are considered unable to possess truth, reason, at least we, they accept the dominant truth. How can the privileged people listen to indigenous black people how can the privileged people can listen to indigenous black people to the other? This idea of listening itself is part of indigenous culture, but if an indigenous woman tells us this, nobody would listen. Um, I just wonder, Emily, if you would have a brief comment on both of those um, statements really, or questions, if you, if yeah. you got them, can you see them? I think I think both those questions are uh, both both those um, things the comments that people shared there are really important for us to center also so as we talk about I think of whiteness and white dominance as um, invisible and yet centered and this weird phenomenon of being invisible around uh, it's very visible if you are not white but the power of whiteness, Richard Dyer says, is not to appear superior, but just to colonize the normal and to be baked into the fabric of everything around us such that it's the air we breathe. Um, uh, and so we're trying to bring it into view and put it on the hook. And we're trying to um, decenter it by making it visible and, and, and then subject, subjecting it to critique. But we're also in this panel, you know, all three um, white people talking about this work and working in this work in this context. Um, and these comments I think are especially important for um, the stakes of what we're in. I think it, um, the stakes of what we're in. So what we, in doing this work, I think about the privilege of being able to opt in and out of even thinking about this and engaging with these um, realities and pressing needs as interesting, um, as something I'm curious about, especially as academics. And I think, it is crucial for us to remember how life and death these are for people and how uh, the stakes and how inescapable um, these realities are um, for people. So thank you for sharing both of you actually, and especially the phenomenon of being, um, I mean, there's a lot, there is a lot of work done on the internalization of col colonial mindsets um, from Franz Fanon, you know, to Césaire, to um, Glenn Coulthard and others. So the sense of, um white dominance is also these it's something carried and by you know if you've gone to school if you've been a part of a society that's telling you what is a value and who is a person uh your whole life um these things get internalized too they're not just white people also holding them unfortunately so that's interesting Shanette, your your comment there about supporting dominant views i don't have an answer for you but i just want to recognize the challenge of that and living with that as incredibly difficult. I'm struggling too, but I can't imagine what it's like to struggle um, living with them and being intimate and not and, and seeing the stakes of that. And Ibiske, I also want to say um, that's absolutely true. Sometimes that's why I think it's important for white people to realize these are white problems. These are white things. We, we have to do our own critical race work. Um, Alexis Shotwell calls it claiming our bad kin. We need to claim our bad kin. Um, and um, also because it's our own work, but also because there are ways that we can be heard sometimes when others can't. Um, so thank you for raising that. Absolutely. There is so much to learn about learning how to listen and the work we need to do to be able to do that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a million. Yeah, I think we've got one time for one more question here and it's from, um, from Joe, from Joseph Manelli. And this is for you, Sean. 
And Joe asks, do you think that the far right is linked to an economic project, collateral damage perhaps for the neoliberal goals, the neoliberalist goals? John? I mean, my answer to that would be that the, it's such a, the, the thing we call the far right is such a heterogeneous formation that I, I think, uh, you know, I'd be hesitant about attributing a sort of singular, sort of, you know, uh, sort of neoliberal, in a positive sense, sort of neoliberal logic, where, where the argument would overlap a little bit with what Shamsi was talking about, is that I do think the hostility to social justice becomes a kind of disciplinary device to sort of limit, to limit our capacity to imagine politics or to imagine the political, you know, and, and I, uh, the, the project that I mentioned at the start, where I'm looking at the kind of dialectical relationship between a politics that's affirmative of the idea of social justice versus a, a politics that disparages that, you know, the, 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 the standard left response is, is to, uh, you know, it, and, and my own work is primarily focused on critiquing the far right, but I do think aspects of the left, and particularly uh, Emily talked about Twitter being a very, some more toxic sort of space, I agree completely, I, and, and I think what goes on at Twitter has a key role in shaping how we think about publicness now, at least for certain demo, kind of elite demographics that are more sort of prominent on that platform. So uh, I think I, I, I've always thought of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is, is you, know, you can think of it in David Harvey's terms as a sort of class politics that is happy to change policies depending on the context, depending on the situation. But what is consistent is a deep hostility to the left and a deep hostility to socialism, a deep hostility to communism, social justice, any notion of sort of the, you know, collectivism is another term used by Hayek. Uh, so I guess that's, that's where I primarily think, that's my a key angle for me, how, how the forms of online far right politics, how they, how they kind of deaden our political imaginations and how aspects of left online political culture can also be entangled with that. Great, Sean, thanks. Um, I have one more question. I think we've got time for one more. Um, and this is for you, Champsy. Um, it's from Pierish McHenry. And um, Pierish says, I take Champsy's point about finding the utopian and not simply shouting at fascists, but how does one respond to a view which is frankly hierarchical, whether race, gender, ethnicity, or whatever, and which depend, depends on a profound belief in superiority and a form of purity, often accompanied by hate that by definition excludes the equality of the other. Um, I wonder if you could comment on that, Shamsi. Uh, I mean, I, it's very difficult. I totally, I totally understand what's being said here. And I think that was part of my excitement when I heard about, about Emily's work, because my own first impulse when I hear this stuff is to get quite shouty. Um, I find it very upsetting, uh, but I do, I have, over the last year, I've sort of, I've engaged with three people quite extensively who are, who are on the far right, quite far on the far right, and, you know, and I guess that, you know, it, it, engaging with them has made me see it kind of nice, uh, and and actually, they're quite they're quite critical. They're they're a step a step and a half away from a kind of vulgar Marxism in a way, you know, because I think they actually are very often quite critical of capitalism and its effects. Um, but of course, rather than speaking about the capitalist class, they'll speak about the globalist elite, and then they also want to punch down onto immigrants. So look, I don't I I'm I don't have any good answers. I mean, I think Emily's work is is really important here i think just generally listening and trying to understand those elements of genuine critique uh and hope for something else the kind of critique of existing institutions is important you know against the kind of smug liberalism or neoliberalism which assumes that this is the best of all possible worlds and i think you know the really the big work is probably a gramscian one isn't it of, of having strong, powerful, compelling counter narratives that are available. And I think that's one of the real issues is that we're in a we're at a point now, Gramsci would have talked about as uh, 
organic crisis where people are getting detached from the big, uh, you know, mainstream political forces, and there's a possibility of these sort of new projects. And the big new project is probably the far right. And I don't think there are, at the moment, really compelling, strong leftist ones that really depart from that hegemonic neoliberalism, which is starting to fall apart. And I think that's a really big work. So I, you know, I don't have any great answers, uh, but I certainly know that that shoutiness doesn't do me or, you know, anti-racism uh, much good as far as I'm concerned. Great. Uh, thanks very much for that, Shamsi. Um, I'm afraid we have to finish now. I could talk for the whole evening about this, but uh, people have days to start over in New Zealand and uh, dinners to get over here in Europe. Um, those sort of things that we've got to do on our everyday basis. Um, but uh, it's been a really enriching uh, um, webinar, I think, a really enriching discussion. discussion. One of the things I liked much about it, uh, a lot about it is trying to come from the, come to the idea of the far right and the reality of the far right from, from oblique positions, shall we say, to take your phrase, Emily, you know, to try to look at it from a, di from a different perspective and how to react to it from a different perspective. And I think everybody who's spoken here today has really provided very uh, interesting angles on how to approach it, which go a little bit against the current. Uh, and against our own um, intuition, shall we say. And I think that's very healthy for us. So I hope it's contributed to opening up the debate about, uh, because this project is about counter, uh, counter strategies against the far right. So I hope that the debate has opened that up a little bit to try to think about more oblique ways of thinking that, no? Um, so uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks for everybody who tuned in, if that's the correct parlance. To tonight and for listening in and for everybody who's contributed with questions and and most of all thanks to our panelists for taking the time out to come and participate in this uh, just to say that Anne uh, will uh, this will be going up on um, Facebook I think uh, straight away or, and then it will go up on YouTube so you can let other people know that it'll be available online and it'll also be available online on the um, Center for Politics webpage in the Department of Sociology of Maynooth University, where all the all the different web webinars will be available for anybody to access there. So um, I'll leave it at that. And um, thanks very much to everybody. Yeah, Anne's just put it up there for people to access. So we'll finish up here now. Thanks very much. <laughs>